On both sides of my family, I come from a long line of country folk who hail from the upstate in the sand hills of South Carolina. But we had one set of city dwelling cousins who lived up in Manhattan. And whenever we would go to visit, they made sure that their southern kin had an opportunity to take in a show or two on Broadway. Now, I don't know if they still do this in Broadway shows, but back then, when the lights went down and the hush began to settle over the audience, the orchestra would start to play. And while the curtain was still down, and while the house lights were still dim, the orchestra would take us on a brief musical tour to preview all the themes that we would be hearing throughout the show. It's an effective device, because it means that when you get to those songs in the course of the drama, you will have already heard them. And that means that that the, the likelihood will be greatly increased of those songs having their desired effect upon you when you get to that point in the story. Well, in a sense, that's what Palm Sunday is designed to do. This day is like an overture that prepares us for the events that are about to unfold throughout this coming Holy Week. Every year on this day, we begin on the road into Jerusalem. We are told of our Lord's plan to ride a donkey into that great capital city that is abuzz with all those pilgrims who have come from all known corners of the world to celebrate the Passover. And with that beginning, we are quickly ushered through God's word on a breakneck tour to preview all the events that took place in that week that led up to our Lord's crucifixion. The triumphal entry of Palm Sunday sets everything in motion, but then flashing before us come the betrayal of Judas on Spy Wednesday, the Last Supper of our Lord on Monday Thursday, and yes, the crucifixion on that strangely named Good Friday. All of those moments are introduced to us here on Palm Sunday so that we'll be ready to enter into them when we walk together through this coming Holy Week. But friends, before we turn our attention to this opening act, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, I want to urge you all to make whatever arrangements you need to make, to make whatever sacrifices you need to make in order to be present, emotionally, spiritually, mentally present for this entire week, to make yourself open and available, mind, body, and spirit, to the work of the Holy Spirit. And if at all possible, to be physically present with us as we commemorate day by day, as a community, as God's people, all of the events of Holy Week, but especially on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Well, having introduced to us all the great themes of the coming drama of Holy Week, the orchestra brings the overture to a close, and it moves us back to where that medley began. As the curtain opens, we hear a Middle Eastern melody that carries us out into the Judean desert where we find Jesus and his disciples making their way toward Jerusalem. The sun is shining brightly in the sky, but it's pleasant and mild. The arid Judean breeze carries away any perspiration that happens to surface on the brow of those travelers as they make that southwesterly trek toward Jerusalem. There's an air of excited anticipation as they approach the city with all those other pilgrims. But each of the disciples, in his own way, can't help but feel like there's a little bit of a blemish on their joy about the coming feast of the Passover. You see, Jesus has been talking a lot about the future. And he has already been warning them that in Jerusalem, he is going to face suffering, betrayal, and death. And yet, Jesus was always warning them about the future. And sometimes he spoke in metaphor, so they wondered, should all these things really be taken at face value? After all, up until recently, Jesus had only been growing in popularity. Yes, there was that moment a day or so ago when Jesus gave a teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And I'll be the first to admit that that little Speech had cost him a few followers. But surely that was just a hiccup. 
It wouldn't take more than one or two miracles to have the people eating out of his hands once again. Yes, there was certainly a little rain cloud that seemed to be hovering over the festival atmosphere of the Passover as they made their way into Jerusalem, but it was the kind of thing that you could just ignore so long as you kept yourself focused on your hopes and dreams about all that Jesus could accomplish once he arrived in Jerusalem with his extraordinary charisma and power. But then, Jesus brought that little rain cloud back into view. He pulled aside a couple of his disciples. Maybe it was Philip and Bartholomew. It doesn't really matter. But he sent them on ahead to go and collect a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, I don't think everybody caught on, but I'm pretty sure that Matthew did. He wasn't one to be dramatic, but you could just tell that there was a change in his gait when Jesus said this. Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. You could just see it on Matthew's face. Those words were like a lightning bolt that made direct contact with his heart. I'll bet you all the money in my pocket that the verse that was going through Matthew's mind in that very moment was that old prophecy of Zechariah. Maybe some of you know it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, maybe some of the other disciples were able to hold on to their festival atmosphere, but for Matthew, all the joy and excitement about the Passover went up in smoke after the lightning bolt of Jesus' words made contact in his mind with this prophecy of Zechariah. You see, Matthew knew full well that if Jesus was going to get on that donkey and ride it into Jerusalem, then everyone else would eventually make the very same connection that he had just made. And it was only going to mean trouble. But Peter? Peter didn't see it that way. Peter is the eternal optimist. With Peter, it's in for a penny, in for a pound. Leap before you look. Speak before you think. And when all those disciples finally caught up with the two that Jesus had sent up ahead of him, when everyone saw them there smiling, and holding the bridal lead on that colt and laughing as they had recounted that, that it had happened just as Jesus had told them that it would? Peter, God bless him, he was the first one to throw his cloak on the back of that donkey. And whereas Matthew was standing off a bit, clearly on edge, Peter had a smile on his face that went from ear to ear. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it was Peter who picked Jesus up and unceremoniously plopped him down on the back of that donkey. God bless Peter for his enthusiasm. Now, for many of the disciples, it was the first time in a long time since they'd been in close proximity to an animal like this. And so the smell of the donkey, a smell that's not altogether unpleasant, filled their nostrils as they gathered around to prepare for that next leg of the journey. The fishermen among them didn't feel as much at ease around animals like this, but for those disciples who grew up working with donkeys and oxen and other such beasts, the smell of that little colt was a smell that took them back home. Back to that place far away where there was safety and family. Back where things were familiar and predictable. Where animals like this donkey would know the sound of your voice when you called out for them. Smells have a powerful effect on the human mind and the human heart. And the smell of that animal stirred up a deep longing for home. But as quickly as it appeared, that image of home disappears. As Jesus gives the command to proceed and they re-enter that flow, that great flow of pilgrims who are making their way up toward Jerusalem. They're traveling on a road that leads up to one of the great gates of the walled city. And all the gates that lead into Jerusalem, they each one has a name to mark it out. This particular gate, of course, had a name. It was the Golden Gate. 
That's what it was supposed to be called, but nobody called it that. No, everyone calls that gate the gate of mercy. Because everyone knows that that's the gate that Messiah will come through at the end of days when God will resurrect the dead from their graves. And you can see it in people's faces. Again, I think it was Matthew who probably saw it first, but one by one, as other pilgrims are walking along, they catch something out of the corner of their eye. And when they turn and see Jesus on that donkey, and and when they see the entourage that's around them, you can just tell which of those pilgrims know their Bible. Because you can see their lips retracing the words as their minds run along that prophecy from the book of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew follows their gaze with great anxiety. They look over at the donkey, they look up at Jesus. They look at his entourage, and then they look up at the gate of mercy. They look back at the donkey, they look at Jesus, they look at his entourage, and they look up at the gate of mercy. Matthew's anxiety only increases when he sees one such pilgrim take in the scene and give out a nervous laugh as if it's some kind of irreverent joke. But then, as if the workings of some emotional clock have advanced to the next stage, the look on the pilgrim's face goes from one of nervous amusement to suspicious apprehension. This could only mean trouble. And then there's a shout. The disciples can't quite tell where the first shout came from, but they can hear the words and they know exactly what has happened. Hey, hey, look, look, it's him. He's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. By now, everybody had heard the story about the man in Bethany who had been raised from the dead just days before. The account of that miracle had been passed on from pilgrim to pilgrim with bated breath all along that unbroken chain of travelers who were making their way up to Jerusalem. Clearly, there were some in the crowd who had taken this story at face value. And once Jesus is identified as the man who did it, Well, it was like a match had been dropped onto a pile of sawdust that had been out there drying in the arid Middle Eastern sun. The excitement was explosive. All of a sudden, as if by some instinct that had been long asleep in the deep recesses of their minds, as if some long-forgotten key had been inserted into the lock of their collective hearts and the tumblers had fallen into place and the key had turned and the door opened, their eyes began to open to see the signs all around them. All these signs begin to converge in the minds of those pilgrims. The raising of a dead man. The prophecy of Zechariah. The miracle worker riding a donkey up into the mercy gate. All those pilgrims who had been singing and chanting psalms of ascent, that is, those traditional psalms sung by pilgrims as they make their way up to Jerusalem, in an instant they change their tune. It was like a cheer that begins to arise out of a haphazard cacophony of some great crowd that is assembled for an event. The crowd begins to converge on the words of Psalm 118. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Peter, with his great smile and his infectious enthusiasm, he begins egging the crowd onward as the energy continues to build. James and John, those sons of thunder, they, they, they walk down with their heads held high, uh, somehow managing to stand several inches taller with their chests puffed out, clearly proud to be part of Jesus' entourage. Their body language shows that they'd be more than happy to play the part of bodyguard uh, should the need call for it. The other disciples are smiling and waving like it's some kind of a parade. But coming directly toward them are a handful of men who've clearly just come out of the city. You can see them coming because they're moving against the tide of all those pilgrims who are heading up toward the mercy gate. 
Each of them has a scowl cut across his face like some deep cleft in stone. They completely ignore the aggressive stance of James and John and they shout up at Jesus there on the donkey. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Let me tell you, no one who is paying attention will ever forget what Jesus did and said next. The procession was still outside of the city, there on that hill, winding down through that immense graveyard that had grown up outside the city walls. You could see gravestones all around. The Pharisees yell up at Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what does Jesus say in response? He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Those words sent a chill down the spine of everyone who was paying attention. Because how and when would gravestone cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Friends, those gravestones would cry out at the resurrection when they gave up their dead on the day of the Lord. If anybody had any doubt up to that point about what Jesus was doing or who he was claiming to be, then what he said in that moment should have settled it. I wonder, looking back now, as that crowd of pilgrims made their way toward the mercy gate, what could Jesus see as he looked out into the crowd? As his gaze settled on one face and then another, as he smiled at them and blessed them in that way that he could just by seeing them, did he know? When he saw all those people cheering out, Hosanna, like madmen, did he know which ones would be crying out, crucify him in just a few short days? Could he tell, just looking briefly into their eyes, could he tell which ones were simply there just to be part of the crowd who were only chasing the next opportunity for a thrill? Could he tell which ones were hoping that he was going to be some great political leader who was going to march up into Jerusalem and throw those Romans out, sweep Jerusalem clean? Could he tell which ones were nursing their personal aspirations and secretly hoping that whatever this man did up there in Jerusalem, it'd be an opportunity for personal gain? When Jesus looked into their eyes, Could he see the ones who'd given up all hope in these things? Could he see the ones who wanted something more? Could he see the ones who'd been looking with all their hearts for God's Messiah? Scanning the horizon for the one who could stand above it all and yet who took his place right here in the midst of them in the muck and the mire of that road up into Jerusalem? Could he tell the ones whose hearts were open just enough to be drawn in by his loving gaze and take their place in the procession to follow him no matter what it might mean? It makes me wonder, thinking back to that day, if you or I were in that crowd, and if Jesus were to look into our eyes as he passed by on that donkey, what would he see in us? Would our hearts be open and hungry enough to be drawn in by his gaze? To take our place in the procession? To follow after him no matter what lies ahead? Well, that day has long since passed. And yet Jesus is still journeying into Jerusalem. Journeying that everyone might have a chance to take their place in that procession. Friends, as he sets his gaze on you, may he find your heart open just enough, ready to take your place in the procession, to follow him wherever he leads. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous in having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 